All right, um, folks, it's, uh, we're going to start the um, meeting, the webinar. Uh, we have many, many people on. We had started advertising this webinar on Thursday, and we got close to 1,200 people registered for it. Um, right now, we're, uh, our numbers are climbing uh, to well over 600 who are on right now. Um, I think that is an indication of the urgency of the issue that we all feel. And we're really privileged to have leaders of many anti-war organizations from throughout the country that can come together, can address this issue along with you. And um, perhaps come up with some plans of what we might be able to uh, do uh, uh, today um, and into the future to help stay the hand of war. Uh, it's only a few months since the U.S. was forced out of Afghanistan uh, after a 20-year war. Afghanistan, one of the poorest countries in the world, and now they are building towards what we hope to avoid, but what may be a war with Russia, a major nuclear power, which threatens the entire world. I have a lot to say on the subject, but tonight I won't say it. Tonight my job is to facilitate others speaking about the situation. As I said, we have a huge meeting. Over around 1,200 people have registered uh, in just a few days. Um, and I think this uh, really shows the importance of this issue. So to facilitate the discussion, we will ask the panelists who are leaders of the major anti-war organizations in the United States to speak each for about three minutes, exactly three minutes. They we will have a timekeeper. Uh, we will give a warning after two minutes. Um, when they are done, we want to open mics and cameras of others that are on the meeting so they can make uh, um, comments and um, uh, help formulate any kind of program that we want to put forward. Uh, we will limit them to two minutes, and it is extremely important that to get the most number of people that we uh, stick to that. And so we will have a timekeeper. And if it goes over two minutes, we will have to close down your mic and go on to the next person. It's not, we don't want to be rude and we don't want to cut off discussion and we want to have a good discussion. But with this number of people, uh, this is um, what we think we can do. Now, um, uh, when the panelists are done, I'll go over the logistics of how we're going to open people's mics and, and let others talk, uh, but we'll wait till the panelists are done. Uh, we've circulated some ideas of what we might do as a program of action uh, at this particular time, um, and I'll just go over the main points of that. We want to ask groups to continue doing actions against any war with Russia. Uh, you may be aware that on February 5th, a number of groups came together and called for actions. And we actually had actions happen in about 70 cities in the United States. That's a big step forward. We want to call for an international week of action from March 1 through 7. Gives us a couple weeks to build it. All of us and various anti-war groups that have contacts in other countries have heard from them that it is important to call, make an international call. And we hope to be able to do that with the authority of this meeting tonight and uh, bring out as many as we can around the world um, and in the United States during that week to call for no war. We want to call for a day of or day after action actions uh, if there is a major escalation of the war, and we can all put out stuff to our email list, asking people to come out, asking people to do what they can, whether it's demonstrations, vigils, pickets, uh, call-ins, whatever they think they can do, but to do it in an immediate and emergency basis. We have become aware that it's very clear that not too many people know much about what's about Ukraine, the history the coup that took place in 2014, what's going on in Donbass. So we want to try to set up some educational 
webinar in the not too distant future to go try to go over some of that and do an educational piece um, on on this to educate ourselves and the movement. Um, we want each group that can to publicize the actions, especially those during the International Week of Actions uh, that we hope to call from this meeting. And finally, um, NATO will be holding uh, a meeting in Madrid in June. And uh, already there's been an international call for demonstrations in Madrid to protest NATO and to ask countries to have local demonstrations in their own countries. So there may be many things happening before, between the March, first um, week of March and June. But at, at this point, we wanna say that we will participate with the rest of the world in those protests against NATO. Um, we want to keep what we demand very simple. Of course, any organization can raise their own demands when they put forward any actions, but perhaps we want to think about no war, no sanctions, and no to NATO as demonstration as uh, slogans that we can use. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jamal Baraka. Uh, Joe, sorry, yes. can you please give the Facebook link again? There's many requests for it. Okay, so it's the UNAC webpage, United National Anti-War Coalition. It's uh, facebook.com slash, uh, Teddy, do you have it exactly? What's after that? It's, I believe it's no to war, but I, I have to Yeah, I can on. drop the link to the Facebook page here. Um, okay. Though we're still having trouble getting the live stream going. I'll get it going shortly. Okay, um, so we'll be done shortly. Um, so anyway, um, we're going to turn it over to a Jamal. If we have more messages about the live stream or other things, we can do that as we continue. The speakers after a Jamal will be in alphabetical order. It's the only way we could figure to do it. That seemed to be a fair way. Now, Jamal Baraka is um, the national organizer of the Black Alliance for Peace. Um, he is a member of the UNAC Administrative Committee. He is on the Executive Committee of the U.S. Peace Council, and he's going to speak a little bit longer than three minutes and try to frame the discussion that we're having today, Ajamo. Well, thank you so much, Joe, and I'm going to still keep it relatively short, uh, no more than about five minutes. We have a lot to talk about, a lot of very um, um, uh, important people who have uh, some very important things to say to help us to understand where we are and where we need to go uh, as a movement. Uh, we are encouraged by the turnout this evening. We hope that it is a reflection of the gravity of the situation in Europe and not a reflection of, of Eurocentrism. We hope that this might be one of those inflection points for the movement uh, where the anti-war, pro-peace, and anti-imperialist components are revitalized. And we find a way to concentrate our powers through more effective coordination, communication. Uh, so that in the future, when, we, uh, when the call goes out to mobilize for Haiti or to oppose subversion in Ethiopia that results in war or to oppose AFRICOM, we will have the numbers that will demonstrate to the warmongering criminal US state that there is popular opposition and unbreakable solidarity. We are familiar with what is unfolding in Ukraine. I'm not going to spend a lot of time going over the background or delving into the uh, intricacies related to the issue. For that, I point you to uh, the Black Alliance for Peace's uh, statements and my writings on the subject from, 2000, from uh, 2014 to the present. Others will provide that analysis this evening, uh, but I hope the thrust of the remarks uh, that we hear from our panel members are structured around the political and strategic questions that this situation poses for the movement. We would like to see the contours of a plan come out of this, of this gathering. But what we do want to say this evening is that for the Black Alliance of Peace, uh, we say that the focus must go beyond Ukraine, uh, that Ukraine is the symptom, but the disease is the US, EU, NATO axis of domination. 
we say that the movement would always find itself on the defensive and in a reactive mode until we are ready to, to take on the difficult work of delegitimizing US exceptionalism, exposing the bipartisan commitment to full spectrum dominance, and stripping away the veneer of respectability that the gangsters of empire are able to use to obscure the crude, raw, narrow interest that they attempt to advance to the detriment of global humanity using terms like the responsibility to protect. <laughs> we say, who protects us from you? Today's Ukraine, tomorrow it might be China, even while the people of Afghanistan are starving, bombs are still dropping uh, on Yemen. The wars continue in Ethiopia. Black and colonized people are still subjected to military occupation by the domestic army known as the police of the US. And the people in more than 30 nations still suffer from illegal sanctions imposed on them by the axis of domination as collective punishment for daring to attempt to exercise national self-determination. It is imperialism, folks, specifically the pan-European white supremacist colonial capitalist patriarchy that must be identified as the enemy and struggled against. Others may have different views on this, and that's all right. But this still has to be said because uh, those of us who find ourselves on the receiving end of ongoing criminal uh, configuration of those forces can no longer afford to be concerned about the fragile consciousness of first world activists who still find comfort in the mythology of their nation and the fantasy and the fantasy of something called white Western civilization. We hope that this evening we will struggle to find ways to work together. We hope that we can find ways to take advantage of the war weariness that is starting to emerge with the population in the United States. We should be posing the questions this evening of how do we link the obscene looting of the people's resources in the forms of the military budget to the failure to provide just some uh, modicum of relief to the working class through Build Back Better? How do we make the issue of peace an issue in the upcoming midterm election and indeed in all elections going forward? Let us attempt to focus on developing common strategically informed programmatic work, not just around Ukraine, but the mission to build a new society, one in which we can finally say that the uh, characterization of the US offered by Dr. King as the quote, greatest purveyor of violence on the planet, unquote, no longer applies like it still applies today. Let us work for peace, but let us ground that struggle in terms that will be relevant to the colonized, to the oppressed and exploited of the world. For the Black Alliance of Peace, we ground the struggle for peace within the Black radical tradition, a tradition that says peace is not the absence of conflict, but rather the achievement by popular struggle and self-defense of a world liberated from the interlocking issues of global conflict, nuclear armament and proliferation, unjust war and subversion through the defeat of global structures of oppression that include colonialism, imperialism, patriarchy, and white supremacy. So for us, that struggle is against the structural, the material interest that drives state policies that must be identified and defeated. Again, it is all captured in our opposition to imperialism and why BAP says as members of the Black is Back Coalition, the task is to turn imperialist wars into wars against imperialism. That we see as the task and our responsibility and on that, we, we say there will be no compromise and no retreat. So let's get to work. Defeat imperialism, dismantle NATO, fight for people-centered human rights, all power to the people. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ajamo. Okay, we're going to start down um, our list, and uh, the next speaker in alphabetical order is Leela Anand, who is a nurse, and tonight she's representing the Answer Coalition on um, our meeting webinar. Uh, Leela. Friends, sisters, uh, brothers, those of us who have joined to participate as panelists uh, and those who are watching, it goes without saying that the world has come to the very brink of what might be a major war. My name is Leela Anan, and I'm the Southern Regional Coordinator of the Answer Coalition. The decision by the Russian government to recognize the Independent People's Republic of Donetsk and Luhansk, and based on the recognition of those entities, the Russian Federation has sent its troops into these areas that until now constituted significant eastern regions of Ukraine. I don't need to tell any of you that the U.S. and NATO powers have declared the Russian actions as an invasion of a sovereign country. And we all know that the U.S. is imposing major economic sanctions uh, designed to cripple the Russian economy and to, in fact, destroy the Russian people. There are a few immediate questions that need to be addressed. And because I only have a few minutes, I'm going to try to do it quickly. So first, who is responsible? Russia has been labeled as the aggressor and clearly Russian troops are inside what was formerly Ukraine. That is beyond dispute. But what is disputed is what caused the crisis. Why would Russia have intervened in Eastern Ukraine knowing that it would face an avalanche of economic sanctions and possible political and diplomatic isolation, at least on some level. For those in the US anti-war movement, it is critically important that we not fall in line with the chorus led by the militarists, by the military industrial complex, by the imperial politicians of both parties and by the capitalist media, which functions as their echo chamber. Let's not forget for a moment that while the US protests loudly about Russia's violation of Ukraine's sovereignty, U.S. troops are currently illegally occupying and bombing Syria, the land of Syria and the people of Syria, and that the U.S. has arrogated to itself the right to invade country after country. I don't need to name them. But even more so, it is the United States and NATO, which is a U.S.-led military alliance, which is responsible for constructing and maintaining a crisis and a posture and policy that has backed Russia into a corner. So whether one supports or opposes Russia's actions, there can be no denying that, that it is the US and NATO which have step-by-step uh, -step presented existential threats to the security of Russia and to the Russian people. And when the Russian government demanded that these actions by the US and NATO come to an end, the Biden administration and the imperialists in both houses and both parties of Congress said loudly and clearly to Russia, hell no, we won't stop in our campaign of aggression. So here's what happened. The U.S. and NATO powers helped orchestrate a coup d'etat in 2014 that toppled the Ukrainian government that sought to balance between East and West. One that said, no, it would not seek um, NATO membership. The new pro-Western Ukrainian government be began a military that campaign is, against Russian-speaking people's eastern minutes, part of Ukraine. A significant contingent leading the campaign were Nazis and neo-Nazis. Russia tried to come uh, to an agreement and did come to an agreement to bring that struggle to an end with the signing of the Minsk Agreement. And in fact, there were two agreements, Minsk I and Minsk II. The Ukrainian government, egged on by the U.S. government and NATO, refused to live up to the agreement. As a result, thousands have died. That is three minutes. The new government in Ukraine also requested membership in NATO, which would have the effect of placing advanced weapons, including nuclear missiles, on Russia's border. Weapons that would have a flight time of less than 10 minutes to their targets in Russia. And during the Trump administration, the U.S. canceled the INF treaty that had been signed by Gorbachev and Ronald Reagan in 1986. And that treaty banned the placement of missiles that had a flight range of 300 to 600 miles. This was of monumental importance. And what did the U.S. government do? It unilaterally canceled it. The U.S. also canceled the anti-ballistic missile treaty. 
These two acts made it clear to the Russian government that the U.S. was planning to place advanced nuclear missiles and engage in a nuclear first strike strategy that once in place would signal to Russia that Russia would never again have a day of peace, a day free from threat. The Russian government made it clear in the last few months that the U.S. would never accept the placement of such missiles on the Mexican-U.S. border or the U.S.-Canadian border. Instead of saying yes to Russia's reasonable demands, U.S. imperialism stoked the crisis. They were calling Lala, Russia's could you bluff. finish so that others if can Russia speak also? Stepped back, sure, I'm almost done. Without its demands being realized, then the Russian government and the country of Russia would be forever humble and subjected to nuclear blackmail. So today we in the Answer Coalition, you know, we're joining with others in this country and around the world to demand not simply that NATO stop its further expansion. We're demanding that NATO be dissolved because NATO is the threat. The U.S. war drive is the threat. And we are also demanding that instead of endlessly going to war and spending trillions of dollars on war, that the resources of this country be used to provide that which human beings actually need. So end NATO today not tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Teddy, uh, first of all, by the way, the, uh, it is being live streamed right now on the UNAC page. If people would like to live stream to their own page, we got that uh, fixed. And Teddy, I've given you back the host so you can um, uh, play that role. And I'm going to introduce our next speaker, who is Medea Benjamin, really doesn't need any introduction because everybody in the movement and most of the country know who she is. She's the co-founder of the incredible, wonderful, um, creative organization known as Code Pink. So Medea, you're up. Yes, how exciting to be on with over 800 people. Uh, and thank you to all the organizers for this. We are facing a barrage of a media, White House, and congressional narrative uh, that is this dichotomy of Russia bad, the aggressor, and U.S. NATO good, the protector. We probably have differences of opinion. I'm sure we do in this group about Russia, but our job, as most of us are Americans, are to deal with the U.S. aggression. And demonizing Russia has been going on for years. In fact, the Democrats have been so guilty of this because it was uh, their narrative that Russia and Putin were uh, the ones responsible for Hillary Clinton losing the election to Trump instead of acknowledging what a bad candidate Hillary Clinton was. But talk about interference in elections. We have to talk about the U.S. interference in the 2014 uh, coup uh, and the U.S. giving $2.7 billion of our tax dollars in weapons to Ukraine since the coup in 2014. Uh, we can't talk enough about the expansion of NATO. It is absolutely critical. Uh, we would be in the in this position if the U.S. had kept to its pledge not to expand eastward, instead uh, adding 14 new countries, and most of them in the sphere of influence of the USSR are actually part of the USSR. Uh, and then uh, there is the the surrounding of. Russia by U.S. troops. There are over 90,000 U.S. troops already stationed in Europe. Many of them right now, Biden is repositioning to get closer to the Ukrainian border, uh, and he is sending over more troops. And we have 8,500 U.S. troops in, in the U.S. on high alert. But at the same time, uh, Biden is insisting that there won't be U.S. troops fighting in Ukraine. Uh, well, then why is he doing all of this? Why is he sending all these troops overseas? But the reason he's saying that U.S. troops won't be involved is because the American people don't want to see U.S. Uh, uh, soldiers die in Ukraine. They don't understand uh, what the importance of Ukraine is. And poll after poll show that no matter people's political affiliations, they are against U.S. involvement in a war in Ukraine. That's the best thing we have going for us. And that's why we can, at this point, build a movement that is stronger. And uh, uh, Joe said that on February 5th, we had 75 cities that participated in anti-war demonstrations. Well, let's give ourselves a challenge for the first week of March to double that number and double the number of people that come out for those. Um, we can do it, and we can do it with a call that says, no war. Uh, no NATO in Ukraine, and to follow the Minsk Accords, which is the framework that already exists 
uh, for de-escalation of the of the crisis in the Donbass. And last, I wanted to let people know that we're going to be having an extraordinary uh, online rally, international one, this Saturday with representatives from Ukraine, Russia, members of parliament from the UK, France, Germany, Spain, and Belgium. I'll put the link in the chat and we can tell them what we come up with today and ask them to join us globally in saying no to war, no to NATO. Thank you. Thank you, Medea. Um, hey, Joe, well, this is Kaskia. I would just really like to thank our speakers who have just spoken. Um, and I just want to remind folks of the three minutes. Um, if you do hear me unmuting myself and interrupting you, it's not to be rude. It's just to let you know that your three minutes are up. So I just want to put that out there. Um, and yeah, let's continue. Thank on. you, Cassia. Cassia has the hardest job today. She's the timekeeper, so she has to interrupt. Uh, people who have an awful lot to say, um, but it's needed if we're going to uh, get as many voices as we can and kind of find unanimity. Our next speaker is Sarah Flounders. She is uh, from the International Action Center. She's on the UNAC Administrator, uh, Administrative Committee. She's a member, she's the editor, um, contributing editor of the Workers' World newspaper. I think I got that right. Uh, Sarah, you're up. Thank you. Thank you, all the speakers here. And I want to urge the strongest support for mobilizations March 1 to 7 across the country, around the world. It's a dangerous moment and unified demands. No war, no sanctions, no to NATO. That's crucial. Now, creating a stampede is an ancient tactic. The earliest hunters knew that an entire herd could be stampeded off a cliff through the calculated use of smoke and noise and relentless drumming. Today, the European Union is being run off a cliff and we can't be stampeded off that cliff. Whether you base your analysis on Lenin 100 years ago explaining World War I as monopoly capitalists vying to dominate markets and resources on a world scale and driven to use their military power. It's late stage capitalism and US and European Union imperialism's fundamental clash is still over markets and economic advantage. So whether that's your analysis or you base your analysis on the New York Times business section today predicting European Union corporations who deal with Russia will be hard hit and expect sanctions to collapse stock markets, drive up gas prices, spike food prices, fuel inflation. Either way, I think we can agree that behind the threatened war with Russia are the largest monopoly capitalists contending for control of European markets and resources. And NATO is their deadly weapon. U.S. corporate power needs sanctions on a massive scale, far beyond what they're using now. They need to shut down Russia and especially China's trade with Europe. There's a big struggle behind this. NATO is today a cancer that has metastasized. It's a cancer that's invaded every part, every organ of economic and political social life in Europe and the U.S. It's continued expansion is to keep Europe east and west in line. NATO is a weapon to lock in place capitalist restoration in the formerly socialist countries. It's a weapon against Russia. It's even a weapon against the EU. Russia's cheap gas transported directly into Germany is in direct competition with US fracked gas. The United States is today the biggest seller of gas in the world due to fracking, and they are driven to shut down the pipelines to Russia, especially Nord Stream 2. Washington has manufactured the Ukraine crisis as they manufacture all wars and as they manufactured the coup in 2014. U.S. capitalists want to dominate Europe. And in closing, I want to say China has already surpassed the U.S. as the largest trading partner of Germany and the European Union. So there's both the Democrats and the Republican politicians are united in their determination to stop North Stream, to sh shut down East and West trade. So U.S. corporate power repeats 
that Russia is the aggressor and must be stopped by sanctions and sabotaging North Stream 2 gas pipeline. We say no to war, no to sanctions, no to NATO, and we'll see you on the March days. Let's join together for that. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Sarah is mentioning the stock market and the oil prices. People might have noticed that the stock market uh, plunged by 500 points today and oil prices rose to around $100 a barrel, which is the biggest in a very long time. Uh, our next speaker is um, Margaret Flowers. Margaret Flowers is the director of Popular Resistance. Uh, she serves on the administrative committee of UNAC and the organizing committee of the US Peace Council, Margaret. Thank you, Joe, and thank you to everyone for being here this evening on such short notice. It's great to see this strong turnout. As you've heard, the United States population is being lied into another war, a war with a major nuclear power. The United States Biden administration is telling flat out lies to the United Nations and to the world through the media and the US corporate media is echoing those lies as they typically do. The Democrats have been successful in their years of campaigning to demonize Russia. And so this leaves us with a population in the US that is largely confused about what is happening right now. This makes it a challenging time to organize, but with you on this call, we have a very strong base of people who are in the know, who are seeking information and who can share that information out. As you've heard, the February 5th mobilization was incredibly successful with, uh, we came together on a Thursday, about a dozen national and international peace organizations issued our call to action on Sunday. And by that following Saturday, we had 70 cities taking action and about 200 people that participated in an online rally. We had over 200 additional organizations that signed on to that call of action. That happened very quickly. And I think that if we can quadruple that online rally with this meeting tonight, that we can quadruple the turnout that we have in the first week of March. So uh, Madi, I'm gonna challenge you double to quadrupling of that of that effort. Um, this is really an important time for unity, and it's great to see that we have this strong uh, beginning to unity. The world is changing, but the United States is not. The U.S. is not changing its foreign policy uh, strategy and tactics. It's not changing its uh, national security strategy of great power conflict with countries like Russia and China. And the U.S. is doubling down on increasing its military spending, arming its allies, over $200 million worth of uh, lethal aid sent to Ukraine recently uh, by the United States and now legislation in Congress that has the support of the leadership in both houses that would give another 500 million of lethal, quote unquote, lethal aid to Ukraine. Someone asked if that's passed yet. No, it hasn't. Um, Congress is on One recess minute. right now, but it's likely that that, that, that will happen. Um, so uh, gosh, time goes by so quickly. All right, so we need to focus on our government, those of us who live in the United States, focus on the United States and the actions that it's taking. We say no to war in any form, and that includes illegal economic warfare in the form of sanctions. We need to change the narrative. Together, we can do that. There are studies that show that when we work in a concentrated effort, that we can change the narrative despite what the corporate media is saying. We need to continue building power turnout March 1st to 7th, and let's continue to build an international peace movement beyond that. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, someone asked how many people we have on. We have over 800 people on right now. We had a registration of about 1,200. Um, so I think it, it shows the importance of this issue in people's minds. Um, our next speaker is Bruce Gagnon, who is the coordinator of the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. And he lives in Bath, Maine, Bruce. Good evening, everyone. Great to be here. Uh, I want to start by saying that we all have to continually work hard to decolonize our own minds and recognize that we've been lied to and literally brainwashed our whole life. An example is just today I saw a video of Biden talking about how NATO was united but I know for a fact that there are quite a few NATO countries that have been formed 
the uh, Biden administration, that they want no part of this ramp up for war with Russia. Recall, if you will, the Rocky and Bullwinkle cartoon show. Some of you might be old enough to remember that. Who was the villain? It was Boris Badenov and Natasha. So this brainwashing starts at a very young age with us all. I urge everyone to keep sharing alternative information. There's a lot of people, even in the peace movement, that amazingly are buying the line from Washington, from Brussels, from the mainstream media. One great resource, I think, is a film produced by Oliver Stone called Ukraine on Fire. I'll put the link into the chat. It covers the whole story from beginning to end. And it, I urge you to watch it and to share it widely. Russian demands that they've made recently, I believe, are fair and reasonable. Uh, I want to quickly review them. Uh, first of all, they want to guarantee that NATO will not deploy missiles in nations bordering Russia. Right now, the United States has established missile launch facilities in Romania and Poland that can fire the cruise Tomahawk nuclear capable missile that can reach Russia in a very short period of time. It's a Cuban missile crisis in reverse, but nobody in America knows about that. The second demand from Russia is that NATO stop holding military uh, and naval war games in nations and seas bordering Russia. Third demand, Ukraine will not become a member of NATO. Fourth, the West and Russia sign a binding East-West security pact. Russia has been asking for One years minute. to develop a real security uh, situation that benefits everyone. And finally, the landmark treaty covering intermediate range nuclear weapons that was uh, negotiated in the mid eighties was abandoned, abandoned by the US in 2019. This must be restored. Finally, we hear all the time that Russia wants to recreate the former Soviet Union. They spend $65 billion a year on, on military as compared to the US at $1.2 trillion when you add up all the various military pots of gold. When you add NATO spending uh, to the US total, it's more than well over 60% of the global total. So clearly interest. we have to ask who is the aggressor? Thank you very much. Thank you, Bruce, and thanks for everybody keeping to their time. Uh, our next speaker is Joe Jameson. Joe is on the executive, he's an executive committee member of the U.S. Peace Council. Joe, you're up. You're on mute, Joe. Joe. Joe, you're muted. Sorry. Am, am I muted? Can you hear me? Not now. You can hear you now. Hear you you now. were you were muted. I don't know what happened. Joe, are you on, Joe Jameson? No, I no, don't see you. He's not. All right. Um, I must have dropped off. Our next speaker then is Margaret Kimberly. She <laughs> is uh, the executive editor of Black Agenda Report. She's on the Administrative Committee of UNAC and a Coordinating Committee uh, member of the Black Alliance for Peace. Margaret, you're up. Thanks, Joe. Uh, greetings, everyone. Yesterday, February 21st, the Russian Federation recognized the Donetsk, Donetsk People's Republic and the Lugansk People's Republics in the Donbass region of Eastern Ukraine. For weeks, the Biden administration and its close ally, the United Kingdom, took the lead in warning of a Russian invasion of that country. Both countries and their EU and NATO allies have invented such conjecture out of whole cloth in the past. I personally recall false tales of Iraqis taking Kuwaiti babies out of incubators, weapons of mass destruction which never materialized, Libyan soldiers taking Viagra to commit mass rape, the leaders of any nation the U.S. doesn't like of killing their people or Russian bounties paid to the Taliban if they killed Americans. 
No one who calls themselves an anti-imperialist should have believed this latest story either. But Vladimir Putin made all points moot when he called the bluff and ended a scheme to kill the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, uh, agreement between Germany and Russia, and to impose more sanctions on Russia than already exist. In recent days, war propaganda was uttered and written at a level I can't remember. But it's interesting, the corporate media, presidents and prime ministers all behaved as if war in Europe was somehow worse than war breaking out anywhere else. Of course, the US is currently occupying about one third of Syria, stealing its oil, imposing sanctions and even destroying its supply of wheat. The US stole Afghanistan's assets and that population now faces starvation. The Iraqi parliament asked the US to withdraw two years ago, but neither the Trump nor Biden administration saw fit to do so. US One and NATO minute. have 800 military bases around the world, mostly in the global south, from AFRICOM to Indo-PACOM to SOUTHCOM, all of which imply a right for the US to claim the entire world as a sphere of in influence. So some of the angst over Ukraine is the result of it being a European country. Uh, and even some client states in the global South accept this. At yesterday's Security Council session, Kenya's representative Martin Kemani received praise when he said African countries accept the ways in which Europeans carved up that continent without regard to African uh, connections. In addition to the shock of hearing him give credence to these notions, I think Somalia might want a word with Mr. Kimani. Its territorial integrity has been violated when Kenya acts as a US client state under the guise of fighting a war on terror. The UN is not innocent either as it works with what is known as the core group of US, EU and Canada to undermine Haiti's sovereignty and to literally choose its leaders. That's My point is that all must be rejected. Inevitably, inevitably, Russia has been targeted, but we must say no to it all. There must be no unilateral coercive measures, no sanctions anywhere, no wars on terror, no invasions, no interference, no claim of phony rights to protect, no NATO, no $780 billion military budget, no core group, no Lima group. We must say no to the bipartisan war party and yes to opposing all of their actions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Margaret. Um, our next speaker, we're coming towards the end of the list and then we'll talk about how others can join this conversation. Our next speaker is Jeff Mackler. He's on the administrative committee of UNAC on the national steering committee of the Assange Defense Committee. He's the director of the mobilization to free Mumia Abu Jamal, and he's a uh, founder of North, North California Climate Mobilization. Jeff. Thanks, Joe. Uh, I have to say, I'm very grateful for the previous speakers because they basically laid out the politics of the situation that we're confronted with. The United States has 1,100 military bases in 110 countries. As one of our speakers said, it spends more on the military than the entire world combined. The aggressor, China, has literally one, mili one military base outside its borders in Djibouti, where the United States, Japan, and France also have a base. And the Russians have about six bases outside the border. One of the contexts of the present situation is the 2014 coup, where the United States backed a fascist-led coup with the pretext that the government of the Ukraine, of Yanukovych, fired on innocent demonstrators in the Maiden uh, city center. The truth, as revealed by Victoria Nuland, the US representative to the EU, was that the fascists fired on the maiden as a pretext. They proceeded to take over the Ukrainian parliament, ban the majority from attending, declared themselves the government, 
passed a series of laws, including the banning of the Russian language, established fascist participation through the Svoboda and, uh, and another uh, pro-Nazi party, and declared that they were going to march on Eastern Ukraine to deal with the Russian majority there. That, that's the background. The US backed this fascist-led coup, changed the decision of the government to seek loans uh, to bail out the country from Russia rather than the United States, because the loans were more beneficial. You have one minute, Jeff. With Medea Benjamin, when she said, yes, of course, we all have differences. But those differences are on the way to resolution as we seek to return to the streets the first week in March. We need united front mass action protests opposing the U.S. war moves, opposing NATO, opposing the sanctions that the United States imposes on 40 countries. We need to return in time to those days when COVID permitting, we have mass national anti-war conferences that mobilize the entire movement in the streets in massive numbers. In my opinion, the United States is, a ma is in a major economic crisis. It seeks to dominate the world militarily to solve that crisis. Our answer is no to US wars anywhere in the world, whether it be in Syria or Libya. Margaret Kimberly properly outlined the pretext. Remember the pretext in Vietnam, Tonkin Bay, Three minutes. United States killed 4 million people. The pretext in Libya, the pretext in Syria, all of these are generated to defend, to advance the interests of US imperialism. Let's work together. We have 800 of us on the call today. Let's get into the streets in March. Let's unite on the slogans we agree on uh, here and everyone is free to express their own views. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Our next speaker is Nancy Price, coming to the end of their list. Nancy Price, who is with the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, the US section. She's the co-chair of the Earth Democracy Committee and the Climate Justice Women and Peace Project, and is a member of WILF's International Environmental Working Group, Nancy. Nancy, you're muted. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to see all those uh, listening who will participate on the ongoing actions as we call for peace and no to NATO, no to war. The climate crisis, excuse me, uh, this uh, Ukraine crisis rivets our attention on the region while the climate crisis continues its destruction and death around the world. The movement of Russian troops, tanks, and missile launchers into place, patrols by Russian and US fighter jets and reconnaissance planes over various waters and along the Swedish-Norwegian-Finnish border and exercises and patrols by Russian and US navies in many areas have impacted the environment and the climate. These maneuvers consume immense quantities of oil and gas, spew carbon into the atmosphere, and perpetuate fossil fuel dependency. The oil and gas corporations continue ecological devastation. They contaminate air, land, and water at extraction sites along pipelines and at refineries with impunity, and with no regard for historic con and contemporary harm to local communities, indigenous people, and their lands. U.S. sales and deployment of the new Lockheed Martin F-35 stealth fighter jet to NATO countries will increase NATO's carbon bootprint. It's no surprise that in NATO countries, the military is the biggest consumer of oil and gas with the and the largest emitter of greenhouse gases. The commander of U.S. Air Forces in Europe Air Forces Africa and head of the Allied Air, uh, Allied Air Command claimed that these F-35s will decrease Russian actions and the threat of, and the threat of an invasion that looms. Uh, this was on February 17th and support NATO's defenses. Did these NATO defenses prevent Russians' recent action? What about the threat of increased climate with more extreme temperatures, drought, food insecurity, cast catastrophic storms, fires, flooding, and rising seas. What about the danger women, dangers women, children, families, the elderly, and vulnerable populations face 
as they one seek, minute left. As they seek security elsewhere, making competition over scarce resources, uh, conflict and war more likely. Does US and NATO deployment of squadrons of F-35 jets made us, make us secure? The US has sent F-35s to Norway and Finland, not a NATO country is buying 64 uh, F-35s. Other NATO countries have or will have them. Switzerland, also not a NATO country. Belgium, Denmark, Norway, the UK, Italy, the Netherlands, Poland, Greece, Romania, and soon others will also. Just yesterday, US Navy's Mideast Space Fifth Fleet announced the launch of a new fleet, a new joint fleet of unmanned drones with allied nations to patrol vast swaths of the region's volatile waters as tensions simmer with Iran, just when it seems some progress on talks was possible. Will drones make us safer? We know that from the extraction of raw materials for the life cycle of manufacturing military equipment to production, testing, and use of small arms and explosive. That's three explosive, minutes, Nancy. Explosive or nuclear weapons to clothing and provision for troops are added environmental and climate impacts. Is there a limit <clears throat> to the capacity of of the atmosphere, biosphere, and ocean to absorb and recycle fast accumulating greenhouse gases, restore damaged ecosystems, and protect endangered species. At present, the most common sense thing to do is also the most subversive to those in power. Three minutes, it, Nancy. Yeah, it is to create bridges over artificial divides that have created that have, uh, they have created between our struggles. It's time to raise our individual voices into one collective, clear, loud, and decisive voice that calls for a new path to peace based on uh, diplomacy, human rights, environmental and climate sustainability, cooperation, nonviolence, and social justice. I like, look forward to more discussion about next steps. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nancy. Okay, folks, we have two more uh, people who are gonna speak um, and then we're gonna open up the floor and I'll explain how we're gonna do that. And our next speaker, is uh, Susan Schnall, and she is a peace activist, and she's the president of the National Board of Veterans for Peace. Susan. Thank you, Joe. What a pleasure it is to be here tonight. Thank you all for joining us, and thank you for the organizers of tonight's conference. Calls for crippling sanctions are seen to be gaining steam in some corners of Congress. Demands by some rank and file lawmakers for action are growing more strident, although they seem rather diverse at this time. President Biden says Russia is invading Ukraine and is issuing crippling sanctions as a result. For the United States, the only sane course of action now is a commitment to diplomacy with serious negotiations. No arms sales. We need to build international coalitions for peace not military escalation, which could easily spiral out of control and push the world to the precipice of nuclear war. Veterans for Peace has issued its nuclear posture review to enable the reduction of the real risk of nuclear confrontation through accidental launch or miscalculated escalation. The NPR proposes that all US nuclear weapons be removed from other countries and that the US immediately separate nuclear warheads from their delivery systems as a safeguard from unintended nuclear catastrophe. From war making to peace seeking, we are veterans for peace. We are military active duty and veterans trying to build a culture of peace. As military veterans, we recognize our greater responsibility to serve the cause for world peace. We join others in this coalition. America, wake up and listen to us veterans. We have been to war. We have participated in its death and destruction. We live with what we have seen, with what we have done, for who we have harmed for the rest of our lives. We say move resources from the military economy to the peace economy. America, listen, wake up and listen to veterans who say we are at war in this country, on this land. We are killing our children. We have become the monster in the world that produces more armaments, more battleships, more drones that annihilate whole communities with the push of a button. We give the wealthy everything and keep the war industry growing, great economic wealth and political power. 
We arm the police departments with military weapons that destroy and kill. We export our military violence to the highest bidder. It is past time to stop. As military veterans, we affirm our greater responsibility three minutes, Susan. to serve the cause of world peace. We are veterans for peace. We say no more war. We have been to war and we say no more. No more war, no more sanctions, no NATO. Thank you. Just one more issue I would like to call your attention to. Um, we have an open appeal to those in the military and we know that there is a choice about whether or not to obey orders for deployment to Europe to the borders of Ukraine. We also have faced that dilemma. Some of us have refused, some of us have followed those orders. We have all faced the consequences of our decisions. Join with us in calling for peace. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, our last but not least speaker is um, David Swanson, who is the executive director of World Beyond War, uh, and uh, he also put it in the one line that I asked people to say about their um, bio, is that he is, David Swanson is ashamed to belong to a species that wages war. So here's a member of that species, David Swanson. Thank you, Joe. I'm hearing a lot of talk about U.S. and NATO failures, so I want to call attention to the successes. Feel free to cheer wildly for each one. Germany has canceled a Russian pipeline and will be destroying the earth with more U.S. fossil fuels, and oil prices are up. Poland is buying billions of dollars worth of U.S. tanks. Ukraine and the rest of Eastern Europe and other members of NATO are all going to be buying a lot more U.S. weapons or having the U.S. buy them as gifts. Slovakia has new U.S. bases. Various governments from the Baltics and Scandinavia on down are declaring Russia evil. Talk of a European military separate from NATO seems to have evaporated. In Germany, you can lose your job as head of the Navy for suggesting treating Russia respectfully. In the United States, countless fans of movies about the evils of McCarthyism have announced that Republicans are treasonous Putin lovers. U.S. weapons companies' stocks are soaring. So-called news media ratings are up as well, and it turns out it also costs them less to hire people who can read Putin's mind than it would have to hire journalists. Plus, there's no longer any need to cover any of Biden's broken promises on student debt or education or housing or wages or the environment or retirement or voting or anything else. Plus, Biden, like Trump when he finally bombed enough people, is finally presidential. The whole thing seems to be as big a success for 99% of the people in the United States as a story about Wall Street booming or a corporate trade agreement being signed. That's and this is on top of NATO beating back the non-existent Warsaw Pact for the past 30 years, in addition to bringing such good times to Afghanistan and Libya. Of course, if I take my tongue out of my cheek for a minute, I can recognize in all seriousness that this madness is going to end with life on Earth eliminated, either by war or by environmental collapse heavily contributed to by war. The panic created by calling Putin Hitler is just not matched by pointing out the risk of nuclear or climate apocalypse. A movie about an asteroid seems only to have gotten people to worry about asteroids. The fact is that we need not only to halt each current militarized crisis, including the one in and around Ukraine, but to take each rare opportunity when war is in the corporate news to demand to shift globally our resources to addressing the non-optional crises if we are going to survive. Those include crises in ecosystems, the nuclear weapons problem, the disease pandemics, and the growing plutocratic disempowerment and devaluation of most human beings. That's three minutes. Three minutes. Thank you. Incredible, David. <laughs> we should have set our clock by you. Um, so uh, what we're going to do now is go into a period where others who are on this call can speak. Um, we ask that you uh, limit yourself to two minutes. We're going to be more brutal 
just because there are so many people on the call and cut you off at two minutes, but you'll get a one minute reminder that you have one minute uh, to go. Um, the way you can get on a list to talk is to raise your hand, which is at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we'll try to call on as many as we can. Um, uh, um, uh, so we're going to start, and uh, when we do, we'll turn on your mic and your uh, video, if you don't mind having your video turned on, and we'll allow you to be seen by everybody and make your statement. And um, I'm going to ask Jerry Condon to speak first, who is the former president of uh, Vets for Peace. So um, Teddy, who is our uh, technical person, can you turn on Jerry's uh, mic and and um, uh, and um, okay, here he is, Jerry. If you turn on your your uh, video, you can we can all see you besides hearing you. All right, can you hear me? We can, but we can't see you, but we can hear you. I've got my video. Uh, turned on, but there's a, maybe a problem somewhere. We'll just have to listen to me then. Um, as Susan Schnall stated, Veterans for Peace is very concerned about the growing danger of nuclear war. And we also realize that the f underlying this whole crisis is an aggressive nuclear U.S. Pol policy in Europe. The U.S. has a nuclear weapons stationed in Belgium, Germany, Italy, Netherlands, and Turkey. The U.S. Is, in recent years has unilaterally pulled out of the anti-ballistic missile treaty and traced, placed a, ABM in Poland and Romania, part of a first strike strategy. We pulled out of, unilaterally pulled out of a, the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. Um, we have uh, refused to enter into treaties to ban space weapons and to ban cyber war. So, uh, it's important, I think, that the uh, movement call for removing U.S. nuclear weapons from Europe. If we do that, uh, we will very much be removing the basis for the current crisis. Also concerned about the fact that many people believe that sanctions are an alternative to war. That's well, no. something we need to challenge. Sanctions are a form of war. Sanctions kill. They're often a prelude to War, so it's important we call for no war, no sanctions, no to NATO, remove U.S. nuclear weapons from Europe. And then finally, I would echo Susan Schnall in saying uh, to the GIs out there, active duty people and reservists, you do not have to deploy to an illegal war, an illegal immoral war. Veterans for Peace and other organizations have resources to support you if you refuse to fight in an illegal war. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Um, I'm next going to call on Kristen Dooley, who, uh, um, if she's the one I think she is, she's from Women Against Military Madness and a wonderful organization in, in Minneapolis. Uh, uh, Kristen, uh, um, Teddy's going to turn your mic on. <laughs> There I am. Hello. Yes. Hi, everybody. It's just a wonderful panel. Um, we at Women Against Military Madness have been around for 40 years this year. Um, yay us. Uh, and we still are against war. And I think one of the things that, that we've learned, I remember going to fight when uh, the U.S. did the shock and awe in Iraq. And... Um, they said at that time people were saying well we can have sanctions or we can have war and uh, we put out a document saying that both were a way of killing people and killing citizens so coming up for the week of the of march 1st through 7 we're going to be doing uh one of our regular vigils will turn into uh end war in russia vigil but we're also doing an event on march uh let me make this right. A rally on March 19th, which is the 19th anniversary of U.S. involvement in Iraq. 
And uh, that's to say no to war on Russia and no to sanctions. So I hope other people, other groups around the world will take that up with us. And thank you so much for this. Thank you, Kristen. Okay, let me call on um, uh, Sui Hin Lee. Um, if we could turn on his mic uh, and camera. Did we get, get him? There we go. Yes, can you see me now? Let me yes, just we can see off. You. Okay, gotta turn off. Thank you for inviting me. I just coming back from China for my justice work last week. And the, of course, the Ukrainian crisis has been the topics in China and many other developing countries. But I want to give you a different perspective from a country from Outside the, outside the US and Western country, majority of people don't believe that's going to be a major war in Ukraine. Not doesn't mean that's not going to fight, but not because that is what will most of people around the peace topic world from a developing country think this is just a US and Western world's imperious threat against Russia and China to maximize the benefit from the ripping off from these countries to developing countries and for to gain a more military base to surrounding Russia and China. US is not stupid enough to go into launch a World War III tomorrow, but what they want is going to be creating a new Cold War against Russia and China. They're originally they're thinking about that going to either using Xinjiang or Taiwan in China to against China or Ukraine. One minute. But now Ukraine become an issue they want to use. For the short run, what they want is, a, is a going to be a, a, a money making opportunities from US, US from um, weapon sales to selling the natural gas to a political sanction that scaring the Western European country to more alliance to the US. So that is the, the shortest goal US want to do. For peace-loving and anti-war activists around the U.S. and around the world, number one is demand U.S. out of Europe, U.S. and NATO out of Ukraine, and no sanction, and uh, start the talk again with Russia and to launch a peace. Thank you. Thank you, Sweden. Um, I ask when people, when they speak, if you could say, uh, what if you're a member of an organization, what organization it is, and where you're from? Okay, I forgot. It's Su Hin Lee from uh, China US Solidarity Network and National Immigrant Solidarity Network. I've been working on peace and justice works last, home, last couple of months in China and I just back to LA last week. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, Gabrielle Gamma, I'm going to call on next. Um, Teddy, if you can turn on. Uh, Gabriel's mic and camera. Are we getting her or him? There we go. Uh, Gabriel, you're. Can you you're hear muted. me now? We can hear you. You can. If you'd like, you can okay, turn well, on your Okay, well, greetings to everyone camera. from uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, um, the Gulf Coast, the Deep South that's been ravaged by climate change um, and militarism. Welcome to the place where you still see roofs covered with blue tarps uh, from one part of the state to, through Mississippi, through Alabama. And of course, the federal government does not have the money to provide for roof repair as we start the slow drift towards the next hurricane season. A place welcome to New Orleans and Louisiana and the Deep South, the home of $7.25 minimum wage. The place where the poverty level is so high uh, that and nothing is being done where the money from the infrastructure and the rescue funds are being used to give away to corporations, including oil and gas companies, 
and every profit-making institution that you can find. Yeah, uh, I'm not, not going to get into the issues that are so important to educate people about as involve Ukraine. But my organization, the Workers' Voice Socialist Movement, wants to raise to you all here to consider to put in your calendar is the need for us to turn our face to the working class of this country, a force that can stop imperialist war. We need to be very simple and clear. There is not a single country on earth that has benefited from a US invasion or sanction. The people have suffered and gotten poorer and lost political rights. There is not any reason for a US intervention except to enrich the super wealthy and the war profiteers. I would urge that we include a day of national action and, and with a goal of getting out 2 million flyers directly on the street in face-to-face -face discussions with people at bus stops, train stations, workplaces, and whatever else that you can find. This is what we've been focusing on doing in New Orleans and in Louisiana. We need to make it clear that these wars are for nothing but profit and gain, and that the government, which is bought and paid for by these corporations, is a government of and by the wealthy and only for their benefit. And Sorry, we had to cut people off because we need to, there's a lot of people with their hands up. I'm going to call on David Kyle next. And um, uh, if people want to talk about how feasible they believe these days of action might be in their area, that would also be very welcome. So David Kyle will be next. David, you're on. You okay, can be... thank you. Um, I, I'm uh, with the Green Rainbow Party in Massachusetts. I see there are other Greens here. Uh, Gloria Matera is here. Um, there's been discussion in the Green Party here about actions. Jill uh, Stein has spoken at a protest about Ukraine uh, February 5th. Uh, there is organizing uh, in Boston, there's a coalition in Boston. Mass Peace Action is at the center of that. I believe there could be a great, great Boston participation in a day of action. Uh, what a wonderful idea. Um, let's go with that. Um, we, we need to plan the timing, but the sooner we get going, the better, of course. Uh, at the same time, we see that Biden is hesitating uh, if we can start to psychoanalyze Biden, he's hesitating to do much. He's already got something. He's gotten rid of the um, the pipeline. And the question will be whether Biden brings Ukraine into NATO, but that might be too much for them to swallow. Over. Thank you, David. All right, next, I'm gonna call on um, uh, Veronica um, Entkrum, if... Uh, Teddy, if you can put on her mic and, and uh, camera. And if folks could put their hands down once they have finished speaking, that would really assist us in the stack yes, it keeping. Would. Thank you. Joe, it looks like Veronica actually declined to okay. uh, come on the call. All right, uh, let's do Christopher Halali uh, next. Can you hear me? We can. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Joe and everybody at UNAC uh, for, for being part of this and for putting this on. Very, very important work. Uh, here in, uh, I'm Christopher Halali here in Vermont with the Party of Communist USA uh, and also with the Red Banner Anti-Imperialist Collective. Uh, one thing that we've been focusing on on the ground here is uh, pushing uh, no to NATO, no to war and no to sanctions. 
But I have to say that one of the concerns that has been brought up from some of our comrades has been uh, some of the other uh, anti-war elements that have uh, uh, resorted to saying uh, things about Russian aggression and uh, other things sort of castigating this and painting it as Russian imperialism. And that's something that we have found to be problematic in our organizing of uh, our anti-war efforts. So I don't know if other people have experienced that with uh, trying to organize. It's one thing to uh, be wary of uh, with some elements um, of, uh, you know, the so-called anti-war movement beyond us out there. Uh, another important thing I hope uh, that can happen is a delegation to be sent uh, to the region. Um, I'm hopeful uh, UNAC uh, and the U.S. Peace Council and others have always been, uh, Code Pink, has always, have always been at the spear, uh, you know, spearhead in terms of uh, delegations uh, and supporting, um, you know, peoples abroad uh, facing uh, imperialist threats. So I hope that uh, there can be a delegation uh, if possible to, to Russia or to uh, the Lugansk and Donetsk People's Republics. That's something that uh, I would love to see. I know many of my comrades would love to see and we would be very supportive uh, in helping out. Thank you very much to everyone. Thank you. Uh, let's get uh, Donald Smith next on. And if people could put down their hands if they've already spoken so we can see everybody. Hi. Sure. <clears throat> I assume you can hear me. So I'm Don Smith from the Seattle area. I'm uh, active on World Beyond War, Code Pink, and PDA. And uh, I'll put a link in the chat of an article I wrote about how the U.S. provoked a compilation of ways in which the U.S. provoked Putin. I, I have three questions that I was hoping the panelists could, uh, could address. The first is how to overcome the the near unanimity and triumphant, triumphant, um, triumphant um, self-righteousness of the mainstream media over, um, over you know, op opposing Putin, who was said to be completely guilty of trying to take over, you know, Ukraine. Um, how do we, how do we address that? I don't because right now we're losing badly. I, I am um, got into a fight with my brother and with his gay son. When I when I said that you know uh, we provoked Russia, they said I'm I'm a I'm a, I'm a you know Putin um, abuses you know he's he's oppressive towards gay minorities and he murders opponents. How can I possibly defend him? So how how do we address that? And the third thing is our allies are some of the people who are our allies. Unfortunately, are Trump and T Tucker Carlson. That's two minutes. So they think we're nuts too. How do we address that? Thank you. Okay, well, we might see if we can have some time to address some of these questions at, at the end, but let's go down and, and get some more uh, folks speaking. Um, Henry Evans Turnbrink uh, uh, is next. Uh, and Joe, there is a, a list, if you would please. I'm going down that look list. Look at it, um, yeah. if you would please check a couple of speakers. Uh, Henry is, are we getting Henry on or not? It looks like we lost Henry. Okay. Um, Executive member of the oh. uh, Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War. Okay, there um, he is. My name is Henry Evans Tenbrink. I'm an executive member of the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War in Hamilton, Ontario, in Canada. Um, I wanted to mention also the fact um, that the U.S. is also uh, responsible for um, re, um, reinitializing the nuclear arms race uh, through the AUKUS deal. Um, the Australians, as you know, were about to uh, um, consummate a deal with uh, France to produce non-nuclear uh, submarines. The U.S. intervened and, uh, and uh, got the Australians uh, and the United Kingdom to agree to produce nuclear subs, uh, and uh, causing uh, more stress in the uh, Asian uh, theater. Um, also, I, I, you know, I want to uh, let you Canadians on the call know that uh, we've uh, put forward a uh, parliamentary petition calling uh, for the government to um, um, oppose the AUKUS deal. And I, I ask um, P 
people uh, right across around the world to uh, do the same. Uh, petition your governments to uh, to oppose this deal. Um, you have one minute. Thank you. Um, and I just wanted to mention here in Hamilton, Ontario, we have a sizable um, anti-war um, uh, group of anti-war activists, and uh, we're we're anxious to join you in in a world. Uh, wide day of action. Uh, thank you for for uh, bringing this uh, forward uh, to uh, UNAC, and, uh, and this uh, this is a very important issue. And uh, you have a lot of support in Canada. Thank you. Just to be clear, this is um, a form of the entire anti-war movement, not just UNAC. Um, although I'm very proud that UNAC is is very much involved with this. Um, I'm going to ask Elizabeth. Ecker um, to come on next. Sorry, it takes a bit for people to um, get on. I see that Vanessa Marie from uh, Bariquas is on, and yeah. Alice Slater, and okay. Warren Steiner. So um, yeah, yeah. Also I Naomi Jaffe, who I want to call on. She has some uh, important. So let, okay. let's. So if we call. could have um, maybe Vanessa, Vanessa, Marie. and then Alice, and then Naomi. How about that? Vanessa, you're next. And also we'll have Lauren Steiner. Yeah. Okay. I don't think we have uh, Elizabeth. Okay. Um, Alice Slater, you're on. Alice, you're muted. Okay, here I am. <laughs> Hello, this is fabulous. I think the most disturbing thing to me of all is we all know so much about everything is how our media has been behaving. I can't even look at my New York Times and I'm wondering if we could think about, you know, setting up phalanxes of people in New York and Washington to go to the major newspapers and bang on their doors and talk to their editors and give them our fact sheets and, and tell them that they're, they're missing an opportunity. I just think we have to do a little more brainstorming on the press. I mean, it's like ridiculous with how they're talking about Russia. I mean, we've been doing this forever. Stalin said to Truman, turn the bomb over to the UN after we formed the UN to end the scourge of war. And he, we said no, so he got the bomb. And Gorbachev, we promised we weren't going to expand NATO. I mean, I think we all know this, but why isn't the media writing about this? Why aren't they? So I think we need a little more brain. One minute. That. And I'm, anyway, that's my thought right now. Thank you. Vanessa followed by Lauren followed by Naomi. Vanessa. Hello, um, my name is Vanessa Maria Graber and I am I'm from Philadelphia. Um, I work for Free Press and I'm the News Voices Director. And if you recall back in 2003, Free Press assembled the first ever national conference on media reform to address this very issue that Alice was talking about. And so I do have some solutions and some comments on that, but as we know, media propaganda and disinfo campaigns are what's fueling support for the war. And this is largely caused by a long history of media consolidation, the erosion of local journalism, and the lack of media ownership by people of color. Um, we need to demand media accountability for coverage that's not critical, uh, for using anonymous sources, unverified intelligence, um, and for excluding the voices of Russian and Ukrainian people, and especially those who are against the war. Um, and I think that what we need to do is come up with a strategy to demand critical analysis, dissenting views, and fact-checked, verified information instead of just repeating a lot of the um, you know, intelligence, which we have no documentation or evidence for. 
one of the things we all can do are write up eds and that's right, contact the newsroom, contact the journalists, let them know that you're not satisfied. Um, We need to spread awareness on social media. We need to have more conversations like this locally, use Zoom, use Facebook Live, use YouTube, use all the tools that we didn't have when the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan started. I think that that is really critical right now. We don't have enough people holding these conversations. We also need to support community and independent media. So if there is a Pacifica affiliate in your town, consider donating to them. And if you do subscribe to mainstream media or public media, unsubscribe, unfollow, and take away your memberships and let them know that you're doing so because they're not creating content that's serving the public interest. I plan to write more about this um, at Free Press, so um, please follow us. And again, support your local independent and community media. And if you don't have any, start making your own. That's exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, Vanessa. Um, some of us have been working with in our sanctions kill coalition with uh, talking about how we can address the media. Maybe it's something you would like to join us with and I will let you know because I took your name down um, and uh, of what we're doing and maybe you can help with that. Lauren, uh, you're next. Hi, um, I'm Lauren Steiner organizer, activist, independent journalist now based in Asheville, North Carolina. I'm proud to say that I've had half the speakers um, on this panel on my show over the years. And I totally get what's going on here. And I spend most of my time arguing with other supposed progressives. um, And it's very difficult to counter the mainstream media. The show that I did with the late, great Kevin Zeese back in 2019 about what Victoria Newland did in 2014 is incredible. Um, about 250 more people have watched that show since I've been sharing it. And I also talk about how the 14 countries joined NATO after George Shultz promised that they wouldn't expand. But what I want to ask the panelists or whoever wants to address this is, how do you respond to this fellow His name is uh, Jan Korhonen. He calls himself a Finnish leftist. And he wrote this whole Twitter thread today saying that what Russia is doing has nothing to do with NATO expansion. All you have to do is listen to Putin's speech about dissolving the Soviet Union was a a mistake. And his contention is that Russia is worried about other countries um, who have become uh, democracies who want to join NATO. That they um, are that they're going to come to Moscow and that Russia is going to be threatened as well. I'm interested to how how to rebut that. Okay, um, uh, I think at the end we'll have some time for some of the panelists to answer some of these questions. Uh, Naomi, you are up. I'm Naomi Jaffe from um, Troy, New York, Troy for Black Lives. And I wanna talk about the relationship of the Black Lives movements and the anti-incarceration movements to the, what we're talking about tonight. I, would, I wanna encourage all of us in our peace and justice organizations to connect with those movements in our own localities, the Black Lives movements, the anti-incarceration movements. And what, we talk to, what we've been talking about in Troy for Black Lives is that we know from our own experience what gigantic lies gigantic lies justifying violence from official sources are. We've seen it, we've seen it in our own community. And that the, the, the Black Lives Movement is based on people's own experience of this country being based on white supremacy, um, on racism, on violence, on enslavement, on exploitation, um, and on incarceration. And Ajama, thank you so much for making those connections in your opening Um, in your opening remarks, because I think we will be able to use those opening remarks to make some of the connections that I'm encouraging us to make. uh, I I think that um, that the that the the people in this country, the movements in this country that have been based on um, resisting the internal white supremacist violence and lies are an important source for us of, um, of resistance against US imperialism. 
they're young people. The young the people that I work with are young people and people of color. They don't have access to the information, but they know from their own experience to be open. They they are the most open populations to understanding that what's going that what's happening um, at the highest official level is lies justifying violence. We've seen it in our own communities. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi. I'd like to suggest that we continue uh, this part of the discussion for about 10 more minutes and then just see if everybody doesn't have to, but if there's any answers to any of these questions or any very, very brief comments that the panel wants to make to do that, and then we'll, we'll uh, um, do a summary and, and closing and, and uh, uh, continue on to the struggle. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, Ariel Kai to uh, um, come on next. Ariel, you're on mute. Uh, thank you. Oh. <laughs> All right. Um, I want to thank everyone who is uh, involved with uh, putting on these webinars. And I, I love to see how the peace movement is coalescing. I've been taking part in several um, uh, different forums and connecting with people and, and finding peace activists in the Ukraine and in Russia, who I'm starting to uh, connect with. And um, I, I really do think this is going to take an international effort. Americans can't do it alone. Part of our um, uh, limitations are coming from a position of resistance instead of uh, what's going to be effective in changing this energy field of war. Um, because the resistance doesn't work. You know, it, it really hasn't stopped any wars. So what, what is needed is, is an evolution in our consciousness. And um, I took part in um, this um, other webinar today with Dr. Laszlo, um, who I guess is based in Italy when he works with the Goy Foundation in Japan, the Peace Foundation. And it was so interesting that um, they understand, you know, what needs to happen for us to upshift. And that means expanding our perspective, not using old strategies that are not effective. You have one minute. Okay, so so I, I guess what I'm just saying is let's let's start... I had this in a dream. <laughs> I, I would like people to form groups of eight, find eight people, you know, from, from this webinar to, uh, to work with and um, use that synergy of talking to other people and, and thinking out of the box and starting to uh, visualize, to start to, um, oh, what's the word? To, to, to um, uh, <laughs> you know, find different ways to go about doing things, to, to embrace new perspectives, and, um, and, and that we need to uh, really focus on what's effective, not so much resistance, not so much That's calling out, you know, what, what's going wrong, but focusing on our energies on moving us in a different direction. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's uh, um, call on Dolores Williams next and follow that by Matt Owen, and then we'll see where we are and maybe we can, can see about panelists doing some comments. Unmute. Okay, I was, I'm listening here. I am anti-war. I am anti-sanctions. I'm anti-military industrial complex. But right today, the picture is of Ukraine surrounded by a bunch of totally by Russian um, vehicles, war machines. And it sounds to me like you're helping Putin right now. And I'm thinking, um, are you thinking it's okay if he should move in and occupy 
uh, Ukrainian when the people don't want him. Um, All right, let's try uh, um, uh, Matt Owen next. Ah, hello everyone. It's a great honor to be uh, here before you today. Uh, I am with the California Independence Movement and also one of those registrants to the Peace and Freedom Party, even though there is a party, uh, California National Party within the independence movement, I want to try to move things in a more socialist direction, hence my joy at discovering that this is our historic flag, the flag of peace, uh, emblazoned with the star of liberation, has been since 1836. But what I want to come before you today is to propose the following. If you want to smash U.S. imperialism, help us defund it by subtracting California from it. We have an economy multiple times the size of that of Russia. Okay, so we don't need to be any, under anybody else's wing. As a matter of fact, some people might start to uh, seek to be under ours. But in order to do that, we have to liberate our country, which was Anschluss to the U.S. Uh, beginning in 1846. We have to do that. If we don't, then the U.S. empire remains. Have one minute. So if you oppose the U.S. empire, please, and especially those of you in California, and I know that many of you are, support our drive to do to the United States what Russia did to the Soviet Union. When they left to check a map, there is no more USSR. This whole thing we're talking about is built on the ashes of the Soviet Union. And we can do that. And we are calling for it. Okay. I guess we got... <laughs> All right. I, I think the best way to, to end this is just to see if there are some comments from the panelists, and then I'll, I'll give a closing remark and see where we go from here. So there were some questions that came up in some of the people's discussion. Um, we didn't get to everybody, and I'm sorry, but uh, we had over 800 people on this call today, um, and we tried to get as many as we can. So if you are, the panelists want to just raise their hand uh, if they have something to say, keeping it very brief, because uh, we've had a long night, um, uh, uh, I'll call on you. Okay, so I see David, Cassia, Ajamu, and Medea. And we'll start with there, and then Sarah. Um, Joe, um, I also wanted to make oh, a comment. I'm sorry, I, and I messaged you yes. privately earlier about that as well. Okay, I have you second, Margaret. So uh, I have David, Margaret, and then uh, Cassia. Go on, David. First of all, it is not fair that the wars that get stopped never get counted as wars, as we have stopped numerous attempts to start wars against Iran and Syria and other places, and the success is so great that people don't count them as prevented wars. Uh, secondly, I think the main point that, that people need to understand is that there was no war between Ukraine and Russia until NATO stepped in and started helping. Uh, and so I, in, in perhaps disagreement with many, think Russia is wildly to blame here, but the U.S. is vastly more to blame. And, and were it not for the U.S. role, there would be no conflict here. Um, so, you know, this is the problem with pointing out bad parts uh, of the Russian government. Uh, in addition to which, the U.S. government funds over 90% of the most oppressive governments on earth. So any problem it has with the Russian government has nothing to do with the quality of that government. And attacking a bad government almost always makes it worse, not better. Uh, but I want to agree with numerous comments in the chat that the media, the corporate U.S. Western media, is the root of all of our problems here and is the top place we should be taking our demands and our protests and our disruptions and our nonviolent direct actions. Thank you. Margaret Flowers. Yeah, I wanted to address two comments. One was the, um, you know, 
the, how do I talk to people about Putin and the issue of LGBTQ? And this is a tactic that the power structure and the corporate media use over and over again is to basically whittle a, co a country down to a single personality and then demonize that personality to build US uh, support, popular support for aggression against that country. And this is a classic example of what this person is talking about. Um, what we as people in the United States need to do is focus on what the United States is doing and to, to, to target our government and then uh, recognize that it's up to the people of Russia to pressure their own government over the issues that that country, uh, you know, that are going on within that country. And similarly to the comment about helping Putin, um, you know, as David said, what's not being told in the media is that the United States is funding, arming, and training neo-Nazis who are killing ethnic Russians in eastern Ukraine. If a country came into Canada, overthrew its government, started killing U.S. expats there, telling lies about the United States and aggressing towards the United States, how would we feel about that? So this is, we have to recognize uh, what the backstory is to this, that people are not being told in the corporate media uh, uh, so that we are not confused uh, as this speaker was about the situation there, over. Thank you. Cassia? Well, okay, Margaret um, pretty much responded. Everything I was going to respond to, to the question that was asked. Um, uh, both in the chat and in the Q&A. So I, I'll just say then um, that it was really been wonderful to see and hear um, in general just the unity within the anti-war movement um, as we stand firm against uh, the Biden administration's war games against Russia, the corporate media echoing um, the aggression and militaristic tactics of the U.S. empire. Um, I think this is an important moment for everybody, for all of us to be united. Um, and we all stand here, despite, um, you know, any questions people might have, I think we all stand ready to organize, promote, um, participate in, and advertise anti-war protests. Um, I hope as soon as possible, and especially for the International Week of Action that I hope we all agree to um, uh, the Week of Action, March 1st to 7th. So, you know, let's remember that the U.S. is the primary perpetrator of violence and aggression across the world. Um, and it's our job as Americans to deal with that, as Margaret said. Um, so, yeah, I wanted to say you can definitely rest assured that you'll be seeing us mobilizing in Florida for the Week of Action in March. Um, and no U.S. war with Russia, no to NATO and its expansion, no to sanctions, and, and all U.S. intervention, especially in Ukraine. Thanks, guys. And I'd like to say it's the hardest job I've ever had to cut everybody off at two minutes, all the wonderful speakers that we've had. So I appreciate if you all forgive me for that. But you did a great job. Uh, Ajamo, you're next. Thank you very quickly. For those folks who are really serious about trying to build opposition, uh, let's remember that Right now, Congress is back in their districts. Uh, so people should maybe consider organizing uh, actions at those district offices to let their representatives know that there is opposition to this run up to, uh, to war. Uh, consider organizing disability actions. This is a very difficult time because there's a lot of confusion on this issue. But uh, those of us who are serious uh, and willing to, um, to be bold and audacious organize visibility actions in order to uh, educate the people on what is really happening and your opposition uh, to U.S. Uh, warmongering. Um, and um, let's remember, folks, this military budget issue, I think, is, is, is an issue that we really can push. The state is vulnerable on this, especially in the midst of this ongoing economic crisis. Let's be creative. Let's make the connections, okay? And let's think about a peace congress for this fall uh, to help to to help to with this process of galvanizing uh, a new anti-war uh, pro-peace and anti-imperialist movement. Let's make this issue of peace part of the national conversation uh, that will that will go into the electoral process. Also, let's engage. Let's not try to stand a, a, aloof to this process. Millions of people participate in it. Let's get creative and figure out how we can get access to people and raise up this issue of peace um, and, and global, uh, this, this bipartisan uh, commitment to full spectrum dominance. Thank you, General. Medea. 
Uh, yes, I think there's some uh, great quotes by conservatives that are sometimes useful for us to use. One of them snuck through in the New York Times uh, in a Thomas Friedman piece today, quoting the cold warrior George Keenan, uh, talking about the expansion of NATO, saying it was a tragic mistake. Um, it's going to be a bad reaction from Russia. This was back in the 1990s. And NATO expanders will then turn around and say, we always told you that is how the Russians are. Um, there's also great quotes by our own uh, CIA. CIA director, today's CIA director, saying that no Russian leader could stand by idly in the face of steps towards NATO membership in Ukraine. That would be a hostile act for Russia. Uh, and I think we should put a lot of these quotes in some places that people can use when they're talking to their more conservative um, uh, family members or who Whoever. Um, in terms of, I love the uh, protests at, at the media. We're doing one in CNN on March 2nd in DC, 7 p.m. Uh, if anybody can join, and David, we'd love you up to have you come and speak. Uh, and um, uh, just one more reminder that Saturday is a chance to hear from Jeremy Corbyn, member of the parliament from France, Germany, Belgium, uh, all kinds of places, as well as peace activists in Russia and Ukraine. So I hope you'll join us. And thank you for a great evening. Thank you, Medea. Um, Sarah. Well, this has been an incredibly intense uh, evening. I, I am just looking at the chat. There were thousands, thousands of comments in the chat. I, I don't even know if anyone could have possibly read them all, but it shows an intense level of involvement. The only thing I would say is organize, organize, organize. Uh, it will get harder. So you got to keep it focused on the U.S. and NATO, not assume you can answer every question that is thrown at you. As a matter of fact, don't try. Focus it instead on what you know, which is a billion spent for war at the very time that domestically there's total bankruptcy. So just keep bringing it back to what you know. They show a hundred maps showing Ukraine surrounded there's far more maps showing it's absolutely Russia that is surrounded by NATO. There are 150,000 Russian troops. There are in the millions NATO troops, along with 150,000 U.S. armed, trained, equipped um, troops in the Ukraine, armed and uh, equipped by the U.S. So just keep bringing it back to what you know, uh, keeping it focused. Uh, and I think concretely building actions in March, because when you're out building, you're connecting with other people who really are able to build a network. If you're just answering it in your own head, you will demoralize yourself because you're looking at what the corporate media says. The, the role of propaganda is to create confusion. That there's no other, you know, masters of deception. Keep that in mind. Uh, let's keep organizing. It's also a very important time to reach out to other organizations. Reach out to every possible group and see what kind of unity on a new basis is possible. What kind of collective actions are possible. We should see the March dates as a real challenge and make sure you're listing them all. You're involving them in the speakers as we've tried to do uh, tonight. Never good enough, but it's always um, a step, an important step. So thanks to everyone who was on and helped build this. Thank you, Sarah. We're going to have Margaret Kimberly, Bruce Gagnon, and then I'm going to end it with just a couple of comments and tell, just say uh, a few things about where we're going. Margaret. Okay. Uh, thanks, Joe. Uh, I, I want to amplify what a couple of others have said, what uh, uh, Jamu and, and Sarah said. You know, people are experiencing a great stress in this country right now. Um, that is something you don't have to convince people of. You don't have to convince people that they need their child tax credit back. Um, you don't have to convince people that they need a publicly run health care system. And people understand instinctively, even if they don't have the numbers, they know if you have a military budget like that, that they can't have the things that they need. So I would um, uh, suggest talking about those things where it is difficult to fight with people and I don't think that's useful, but talk about the things that you know people want. 
Um, people want these things and they cannot have them as long as we have a military budget that's neat, that's almost $800 million. That is a first step. And once that is amplified and once those opinions are acknowledged. It's easier for people, I believe, to be open-minded uh, about things that they may not uh, be aware of already. Thanks. Bruce. One thing that uh, we haven't uh, brought up tonight that I think is really important is that Russia has the largest land border with the Arctic Sea. And because of climate change and the melting of the Arctic ice, a whole slew of resources become available that the resource extraction corporations want to get to and drill baby drill. The Rand Corporation has come out with a study calling for the overextending and unbalancing of Russia. And I believe it's really uh, that this strategy is being developed because of this reality of Russian access to resources. We know that almost every war the United States gets into is about resources. So please take a look. I just put it in the uh, chat, the link to this Rand Corporation study and take a look at this issue and see for yourself how it fits in. Thank you and thanks to everybody for being on this uh, really great event tonight. Thanks everybody. Uh, I just wanna say that um, uh, there, this has been recorded I will try to get it into the email that everybody will get 24 hours after the start of this uh, tomorrow. Um, I will also put the program that we've been discussing about actions, especially for the first week of March um, in that email that everybody uh, gets. Um, and uh, I just wanna say that, you know, we've had a, a uh, we'll, uh, 1,200 people will get those emails tomorrow. And we've had uh, a, a good sense of unity here. We're all talking along the same lines. And we also we all understand uh, that where the aggression is coming from, and that's the United States. Whatever we think of Russia, whatever we think of some of these other countries, I have spent some couple of trips to Russia recently and a couple of trips to Ukraine. I saw the Nazis march in the streets with their torchlight um, uh, marches, wearing swastikas on their arms, have with uh, swastika flags, swastikas drawn on the sidewalks and the um, uh, uh, and the sides of, of buildings. There is a real fascist Nazi movement that exists there. Many, many people uh, didn't take the Nazis seriously in, in Germany. They just uh, thought that they were a fringe group that only had 30%, and we know what happened to the world. The can't, world can't afford that again. Russia lost two, 20 million people in the war defeating the Nazis, and Ukraine has the longest border with them of any uh, nation in, in, the, um, in Europe. And so they don't want to see on their border, that kind of mobilization. And while we hear in the news that 150,000 troops are in, uh, in Russia, in the Russian territory near Ukraine, we don't hear that there's 150,000 Ukrainian troops with US advisors and modern US weapons that got there first and started attacking Donbass. And that's what, one of the reasons that the Russians have some fear, but you don't hear that um, in our own media. So we have to educate ourselves and a good part, important thing in the program that we do will be the education that we all have to do. Let's stick together, let's fight together, Let's build a, a movement around, um, on uh, protests on the first week of March. Let's continue to oppose, say no to NATO, no to war, and no to sanctions. And thanks everybody for being here. Um, it's a hard night and we did it the hard way by trying to give the mic to as many people as possible, but all our voices need to be heard. And thank you very much for everybody. And special thanks to uh... Teddy Kelly, who was doing the technical yes. throughout, and to Cassia, who was doing the timekeeping throughout. I mean, it really is a, a collective um, effort. Absolutely. So thank you to both of you and everyone who was on this incredible, uh, incredible program tonight. Take care.